<laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Gary Goldstein. I'm a SAMS accredited marine surveyor, and I have a couple of specialties. One is cargo, one is yachts and small craft. Today, I'm going to speak about uh, cargo. I am currently involved with vessel draft surveys. Uh, I conduct surveys called full attendance discharge surveys, PI surveys, damage surveys. I've been doing this now for a few years, and I have about two and a half million tons of experience. And I want to talk about that. Uh, when I do a full dis a full attendance discharge survey, that means I track every single ton um, from the ship to my customer's warehouse. And that involves uh, ships that are typically either handy or handy max, uh, 30 to 33, 34,000 tons. Um, I handle bulk and break bulk. Bulk, of course, being uh, the larger, the larger quantity. Uh, get involved with PI from the uh, ships side as well. But I'm more often involved with uh, in the full attendance with with damage. Uh, I also, of course, enjoy the heck out of yachts and small craft, but I do enjoy large paychecks, and that typically. Um, is something that I'll see more often on a, on a large ship. The, um, the reason I like to talk about this is because ocean shipping is responsible for 90% of traded goods. A pretty big number. The world depends on shipping. Now I'm I'm not on container ships, although I am an II uh, CL shipping container inspector. Uh, I found that most uh, owners don't feel it's necessary to have me look at the containers until there's an issue. But I am very involved with uh, bulk ships. Again, in the, that, that size, my ships run about 200 meters in uh, length overall. So that's, that's, a, that's a ship that uh, typically will run in that 30 to 35,000 ton capacity. I have um, credentials of note. I'm a draft surveyor. Um, I am the accredited marine surveyor for the ports of Wymas, Topolobampo, Manzanillo. But you might find me in Peru. You might find me in Panama, you might find me in Colombia, I'm all over Mexico, anywhere that is referred to as Latin America where Spanish is spoken. And um, my, my company is, is responsible for damage shipments for the large uh, fertilizer companies. And we are typically discharging cargo. So when I am um, on a ship, it looks something like this. The, um, the reason I'm there is to make sure that the cargo that was ordered by my customer arrives in good condition and in the correct quantity. I'm responsible for 
observing and reporting and protecting my, my client's interests. Once the ship opens its cargo holds, uh, I have to, of course, wait for customs clearance. And once I get the green light, um, mostly involved with either bulk or as in this photo, great bulk, here's a uh, truck receiving big bags, which are 1.25 metric tons uh, each bag. Once the ship is at its berth and uh, uh, customs uh, has released the cargo, uh, first step is to do a draft survey. And talking about the cargo, there are, there are really two significant measurements. And the one that counts for paperwork is the draft survey. Irrespective of what short scales say, when the customer is disputing if there is one or discussing with the person that they bought the cargo, the number that counts is this draft survey. However, the customer significantly depends on shore scales. We'll talk about that in a moment, but the first the first order of the day is to conduct a draft survey. I need to measure the amount of liquids and to start with the ballast tanks. We need to know how much ballast is on board. So once I know what the draft marks tell me as to the displacement. And there are six draft marks, two four, two midship and two aft. Um, I then be can begin the process of calculations, but I've got to deduct from my calculations the weight of the Dallas, I received the ship's particulars. And actually, I require uh, from the chief officer 23 separate documents the bill of lading, the load port survey, crew list, all the things that I need to be able to document what was on that ship at the moment that they pulled in the port and that I received it. And the ship's particulars, and the principal dimensions of the ship. I need to know how far the aft draft mark is from the aft perpendicular forward marks from the forward perpendicular midships. I need to know all of the uh, dimensions of the vessel so that I can calculate the correction. And without getting into a lot of uh, discussion about the draft survey, once we get our general measurements, and I have a ballast water report from each of the ballast tanks. So that has now been, the ballast tanks have been sounded and I have a calculated total, these are all in tons, of the tonnage of the ballast water, calculated tonnage of the bunker from the vessel's particulars, 
I know what the light ship is, which is the weight of the hull. Uh, I'm able to then deduce that what's left is the cargo. But to do that, I still need to know what the density of the water is that the ship is floating in. So we use hydrometers made in England by Zeal and are able to observe the density of the water that, that the vessel is in at that moment. Having collected all that data, I can then calculate the corrected displacement of the vessel, including the density, consumables, the ballast. I know what the bill of lading is. I deduct the weight of the, the, the light ship, which is the hull, the vessel itself. And then we come to a really interesting number called the constant. And on, you can see on this screen here, they have, the, the chief officer has stated the constant. Uh, so here's our, here's our, can you see my, 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 my marker here? I have corrected displacement of 27,796. The vessel itself weighs 10,878. The chief officer is telling me that they have a constant of 350. What's a constant? Does anybody know? Constant is the weight of the crew, their luggage, their spares, all the things that you need to run a ship. You can't run a ship without a constant because that's, that's everything that's, that's on there. That's their food and, and things that they need to run the ship but it's not part of the cargo, it's not attached to the ship, it's part of what you need to run a ship. So that's a stated constant. But after I deduct the corrected displacement, uh, from the corrected displacement, the light ship, the stated constant, this gives me a cargo found on board. Now in this case, uh, the bill of lading is 16,000, <laughs> pardon me, 506. And I'm finding 16,568, that's good, right? I've got a little more cargo than my bill of lading. Um, but I actually found by subtracting these numbers that the constant's not 350, the constant is 411. Again, this is a initial, this is my opening vessel draft survey. If I'm significantly under or over my bill of lading, that's a flag and that's a letter of protest. And as a surveyor, uh, I have uh, the requirement to observe and report. And I observe that I found a number that's very close to the bill of lading, but not more than about half. Typically, when I see more than half of a percent, that's a red flag to me. This number is not more than half of a, of a percent. I'm going to have a little slideshow here that um, I'm going to fire up. Drag that over. So I call this introduction to draft surveys, or the good, the bad, and the gotcha. So how to do everything right and still get the wrong answer. What does that mean? Well, famous gentleman Edgar. Degas said, painting is easy when you don't know how, but very difficult when you do. 
And I think that applies to marine surveying. I, I don't know if you agree with me, but I, I definitely think that doing survey correctly is very difficult. It's easy to make mistakes. And this applies to commercial ships, applies to yachts, applies to damage surveys. And everybody is out to tell you to put their spin on the story. So the surveyor's job is to find the truth, to observe it and report it. Now, back in the day when I wrote this, they were saying that the shipping was responsible for 70 to 85% of the world's trade. Now it's 90%. So it's kind of a big deal actually. And uh, it's kind of a big deal when I'm in the field and I see significant discrepancies. Let's remember that it's a zero sum game and it's true in yachts and it's true in ships. Kind of like the Vegas shell game. You know, the, the shell's moving and you, it's up to you to find the hidden P. And um, to do that, I need some equipment. So essential equipment includes a laptop, iPads, printer, scanner, moisture meters, hydrometers, refractometers, parameters, digital cameras, iPhones, lots of stuff to document, observe and document. And let's face it, the key here is to let the customer know what's going on. And that applies to yachts as well. My job as a surveyor is to make sure that there's no surprises. It's not up to me to tell the, the buyer or the person that's interested what I believe. My job is to observe and report. Now, I may, I may believe something, but I think in today's climate, people tend to confuse their beliefs with facts. I see this a lot. Well, I think this and I think that. Well, wait, okay, that's a belief. We need, as surveyors, we need facts. And to be a fact, it's got to be observed and recorded and reported. So as a, as a draft surveyor, as a cargo surveyor, I start with reading the draft marks. And I always do that uh, in a video because people can allege that I took a photo at a moment that was convenient to me. So by taking a, a video uh, that typically is five or six seconds in, in duration, it's not a large file, but it is a moving document showing what the draft marks are at that, at that time. Of course, I take the water density and document that. I go to the ship's stability book and I review the light ship, the official light ship. That's the weight of the, the hull of the ship. I get the crew list. There's discussions later. I want to be able to say exactly who it was, who the master is who the chief officer is, how we came to these conclusions. I get the vessel's official measurements, the length between the perpendiculars, the length between the draft marks, the distance from the draft marks to the perpendiculars. I get the bill of lading. I need to know how much cargo is supposed to be on board. Now, this is something that's close to my heart. Calibrate the sounding pipes. What does that mean? Well, on the deck, there is a measurement for the length of the, of the sounding pipe. In this case, it's 13.0 or 13.92 meters. It's very easy 
for their oops to be a little 10 centimeter plug at the bottom of the sounding pipe. Now, why do you think there might be a 10 centimeter something at the bottom of the sounding pipe? I'll talk about that in a second, but it's, it's clearly to fool the surveyor. It's clearly to let me think that there's a different amount of ballast water in the tank than there actually is. Maybe I'll talk about that now. It it's, it's, has a lot to do with the amount of cargo on the ship or has everything to do with the amount of cargo on the ship. The crew know that they need to deliver bill of lading. And the best way for them to adjust the weight of the ship is with their ballast water. Because there's only X amount of cargo on the ship, but they can adjust the ballast water to make the numbers come out. And they do that very uh, sneakily with these little 10 centimeter plugs that are accidentally dropped down the, the sounding pipes. So instead of being 13.92, it would only be 13.82. Now there's typically 20 or 22 ballast tanks on a ship. So it's pretty easy to add some weight to the ship. Well, yeah, the ship's got the weight. It's just that the weight is not cargo. So when a draft surveyor finds a calibrated uh, displacement that's adjusted for consumables uh, that may or may not be the weight of the cargo. And again, we'll talk about that in a minute. Once we get all that, we start interpolating. Uh, on a cargo ship, there's interpolation, interpolation, and more interpolation. The tables and the, the numbers that are seen need to be interpolated uh, between, in this case, for example, 7.89 and 7.90, we have in fact 7.8926. So there's, there's a fair amount of interpolation to get the actual number so that we can get a precise determination of the, of the weights. We, we look at the, the uh, hydrostatic tables. So based on a quarter mean, based on the, the different uh, numbers that we have discovered, observed, we are able to come to a displacement that we then are going to uh, correct. So that we correct and again, interpolate between 5.83 and 5.84, we might have 5.8329 or 5.83, uh, any number between 83 and 84. So we need, and there's a fairly significant amount of weight between those two and the difference. So we need to interpolate. Once we get interpolation done and calculating the corrected displacement there, we subtract it from the BL. Here's our light ship. Here's our BL. And we have the found constant. In this case, um, by subtracting these numbers, we find that the constant at this number, 536, which may or may not be the number that's found in the ship's official stability book. Oops, we found 536 constant, but the stability book says the constant is 236.41. That's how much was, that's the official constant. We have a, we have a discrepancy here. And right away, we may or may or not be, not, we'd be ready to file a letter of protest. There's a significant difference in the constant. 
What does that mean? Well, it means that the crew are on CYA, there's an issue with the cargo and the way they're the way they're dealing with that to make the numbers come out all smooth and creamy and, and happy is they've, they've adjusted the ballast water. So a very smart guy said that computers are incredibly fast, accurate, and stupid. Humans are incredibly slow, inaccurate, and brilliant. Together, they're powerful beyond imagination. So dry bulk essentials include electronics, laptops, iPads, iPhones. What I use WhatsApp to report real-time findings back to the office and communicate immediately with the customer. So the customer needs to know that I've found a significant discrepancy in the um, in the concert, indicating to me that there's an issue with the cargo. Now, again, the, the number that that counts to the insurance companies, to the shipping companies, the official number is the dra the vessel draft survey. But the customer has a lot of, of questions. And it's not uncommon for a ship to have multiple customers. So I may not be responsible for all the cargo on the ship. And furthermore, there may be multiple cargoes in multiple holds with multiple customers. So it doesn't take long for the simple straightforward procedure of doing a draft survey to get a little more complex. Now I actually have a couple more slides in this presentation and I'm, and I'm not really sure that they're germane to what I'm talking about today. So let me just look through here briefly. No, they're really not. Uh, I'm talking about in case my laptop craps out, I have manual, I have ways of, of doing all of my calculations um, manually. There's a terrific book called Carefully to Carry that's put out by uh, the, the P&I clubs. If you're interested in draft surveys, I, I strongly recommend it. Um, one of my local neighbors here says, success is where preparation and opportunity meet. And I, I completely agree with him. I'm going to now, discuss my, the size ships that I work on. If I can get this slide to load, I will. There we are. Everybody knows what that is. That's a 747. That's got a bunch of passengers, got a bunch of cargo, but fuel, and a ship, my size ship, a handy max, 200 meters in length, 130 meters in width. Uh, so six, I talk, 600, feet, 600 feet long, 100 feet wide, 120 feet wide, 110 feet wide, carries the equivalent of 100 747s. That is 100 fully laden 747s with fuel, passengers, cargo. That's a lot of weight. And that's what fits in a, a handyman ship. So I've kind of diagrammed the handyman ship with five different holds and the engine room and accommodations. And it's important for us as surveyors reporting to the customer to tell the customer what the current conditions are. So here's, here's something that's in hold five. Here's something that's in hold four. Here's something that's in hold three, hold two, hold one. 
And at this point, I'm going to bring in the concept of bulk and break bulk. So this is bulk. Hold five is bulk granular urea. We'll talk about that in a second. But this is break bulk. These are big bags. We'll talk about that in a second as well. And there's a difference between bulk and break bulk in many regards. But one of the things that is required of this vessel and the customer and me as the surveyor is to meet contract terms. And the ships, the berths that the ships pull into to discharge their cargo require the ships to maintain a discharge speed, typically in my case, about 208 tons an hour. 208 tons an hour is about to the figure 5,000 5, or so tons a day. So if you've got a 5,000 ton a day discharge contract rate and you're under that, there's going to be a penalty. There's going to be demerits. That means that you're at that berth longer than your contract and someone's going to get an extra, extra bit of money to them, which basically is coming out of my customer's pocket. The problem being uh, when we have mixed cargoes, mixed customers, we have bulk and break bulk. That's when uh, we, need to, we need to stay on top of the discharge rate and make sure that the cargo, now this is in Spanish, the cargo goes to who it's supposed to go to. And again, my customer might not be responsible for all the different cargos and the different presentations. They, my customer might be re receiving great bulk in big bags and bulk. So again, I'm as a draft surveyor, I can see the this. I can see the total, and I can see the the weight coming out of each individual hole and I do that using shore scales but I don't have any knowledge, direct knowledge of other customers because they're not mine I'm not I'm not working for them so this is a fairly let's see if I can get this to load up on. I'm going to try one more time. Now, it's a, I, I have a colorful slide that's being recalcitrant. Not really sure why. I'm going to slide this over just so you can see, maybe. See these different colors? Different customers, different holes, different cargoes. What, what I was trying to show. At the end of the day, I need to know about the constant. We talked about that earlier, that the, the amount of cargo discharged reflects the reality of what's going into my customer's warehouse. And if there's a difference in the constant between opening and closing, the opening and the closing of the, draft, the vessel draft survey, I need to know what's going on. Now here, clearly there, there's a change in constant, but this is the opening constant found. The cargo of the discharge, the closing constant found, and the dip, difference in the constant. This again tells me that I may have a problem. There shouldn't be any, any difference in cargo. So we're looking at bulk cargo here. This is a typical scenario. These cargo holds are five stories deep. They hold um, 
one one fifth of thirty three thousand, say six plus thousand tons per hold. And the way we get bulk cargo out of a bulk hold is with this thing here, this grab. Crane brings the grab in. And as this name indicates, it grabs the bulk cargo. Um, once the grab has a load of cargo, it carries it from the hold over to the hopper, deposits it into the hopper, which typically is located directly above a conveyor belt, which you can see on the lower, lower left here. The conveyor belt carries the cargo to another location where it's going to be weighed. We need to know what the weight is. So the hopper distributes the cargo onto the conveyor belt. The conveyor belt takes it to a distant location. There's going to be two things to happen to this cargo. One, it's going to end up in a stockpile or two, it's going to end up in a truck. And if it ends up in a truck, then the truck is gonna get weight. But again, um, without beating a dead horse here, this cargo at $850 a ton, money adds up pretty quickly. And the cargo needs to be weighed so that we can document the amount of cargo discharge. So here's a stockpile. There's the, the cargo that's come off the ship. You can kind of see it falling from above. There's the conveyor belt up here. And there's a, there's a, 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 a bulk scale that receives the cargo and then it's dumped into the stockpile inside a warehouse. The other thing that happens to the cargo is it's, as it comes off the conveyor belt, it's dumped into trucks that are located alongside the vessel and the individual trucks are weighed and documented. So just to give you an idea of scale, and we talked about this, uh, that my vessels carry a hundred fully laden 747s worth of cargo, that is, about a thousand trucks, depending on, on, on where I am or what's going on. That's a bunch of trucks. And it's quite a large amount of information. The cargo is discharged 24 hours a day at, two, at least 208 tons an hour. And in this case here, I've got bulk cargo and there's break bulk over here. I document every single ton with a weight ticket. So this is a, this is a, 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 a capture of a single truck with 21 ton, 21.78 tons Here's the driver. Here's the weight ticket from the uh, digitally uh, generated weight ticket uh, behind there. And actually should be maybe the next second will show. There's a charge order. There's an order from the, the, the customer saying, yes, this person can load cargo. He's, he's authorized to load cargo. And this is who it is. And here's the weight ticket. Let's see if we've got that on the next slide. Uh, again, similar. There are three things that need to happen. First of all, we need to track the truck as it comes in. I need to know that this truck is a truck that's supposed to be here. Two, that he has an order from the customer to load. Three, he's got a, a weight ticket. And it's very light to see 21.12. And then who the driver is. Now well, here's another one. Anyway, each of the ships will have about a thousand of these things. 
And again, depending on, on the customer, Well, I've got another slide that doesn't want to load. Let's see if I can get that convinced to load. And what it is is a, now I'm going to drag this out just so you can see. It's, it's an entire list, I just can't get it to load, of trucks. Well, and I can't get that to load either. So let's let me do that one more time. This is the entire list of shore scales tickets. And this column over here is a running total. Break bulk. Very typical for vessels to have multiple types of cargoes in them. Underneath this cover is bulk. Over the top is break bulk. This is one cargo hold. And for scale, can you see this person? The break bulk on top of the bulk cargo compacts the cargo. And even, even without the break bulk, it's really important to be able to move the bulk cargo with a uh, with the grab, and the cargo gets compact. In the break bulk, each of the bags is is weighs one point two five approximately one point two five metric tons. So a big bag, and again looking at this, so each one of these bags is one point two five metric tons. Clearly, this is a very slow load. The, the, the bags have to be manhandled. They have to be attached to a, a, a beam and loaded onto a flatbed truck. This, the rate of brake bulk discharge is a fraction of the speed of a bulk discharge. It's dangerous. People get hurt. Be careful. Uh, as a surveyor, you know we're not we're not doing the work. We're observing what's happening, and we need to make sure that we keep track of every single truck, all the brake bulk, all the bulk, and document it. 24 hours a day, we know where every last bit of cargo is. And again, look at these guys underneath the load. My staff, I have day staff, I have night staff. I have a truck loadout person. I have a shore scales person. I have a walking boss person who is circulating between the vessel and the berth, between the shore scales, between the trucks, between the warehouse and, and myself. And we're constantly in motion. Um, I'm constantly talking to the crew on board the vessel, constantly talking to my staff. We all have radios, we all have cell phones, we all have WhatsApp, and we're in constant communication with the customer. And safety is what we're all about. So we all have our safety vests on, we all have hard hats, but let me tell you, don't walk underneath the big bags. Now, also one of the things that I need to do for the customer is not only check the quantity of the cargo, 
but the quality of the cargo, the size of the granules, the range. Clearly, I do. This is an SGN size gauge, size gauge uh, number. So the, the, the cargo needs to fall within a certain range of, uh, of quality. And then we have protests. There, there's something wrong here. There's, there's something wrong with this cargo. Uh, some of the machines uh, have leaks. There's cargo that's been damaged, water damaged in transit. And I need to write up a letter of protest, which looks like Yeah, let's see if I can get that to load. All right. Terrific. My letters of protest are sleeping. They look like this. So I will detail what I observe. I will detail what I'm protesting. I will sign it and stamp it, and it will be received and signed and stamped by the chief, chief officer. And this letter goes to everybody. That goes to the ship, goes to the ship's owners, goes to my customer. Everything is documented. I have time logs. I'm keeping track of the total hours, the actual hours, and the delay hours. I'm trying to get my time log to fire up. It looks like this. Typically, we'll end up with about 30 pages of very, very detailed uh, activities. What time the vessel pulled into berth, what time the accommodations ladder was down, what time the authorities got on, what time I had a key meeting with the chief officer or the captain, what time we started our discharge survey, what time we started, we began the draft survey, what time machinery is loaded onto the vessel. Now, this is an excavator. This is not a front loader. This is a 30 ton machine. This is a machine that loosens the cargo. Now in bulk cargo, and you can see some of the cargo on the, the tracks, this is a tracked vehicle. The, 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 the bulk cargo, in order for the grab to work properly, this excavator needs to use its scoop to, to pull up, loosen the cargo and move it around so that when the grab comes in to the, the hole, the, the grab gets a nice full grab which is typically, say, six to eight tons per grab. And without the excavator, the cargo has become very difficult to work the grab because of compaction. Uh, what I'm going to speak to you uh, next about is not this specific excavator, but an excavator just exactly like this. Uh, we're required to have, by contract, at least three excavators. And we have three excavators because there's five holds and typically one hold has break bulk. So they're discharging via, uh, you saw those beams 
and the vessels uh, rig the the crane on the on the vessel ships uh, rig. But the other holes have grabs, and without the excavator, everything goes slow. So in the case that I'm going to show you, the owner of the excavator rewired his excavator. I'm not really sure why, but he installed that was later reported to be incorrect wiring. And at about 2.12 in the morning, this happened. Excavator caught on fire. Now, again, for scale, this is an excavator. That's a front loader, it's a payloader. Um, no, actually, that's not. That's a that's a backhoe. But there's smoke, there's flames. This is urea. Now, urea is not ammonium nitrate. And we're all familiar with ammonium nitrate, but urea when it combusts. Uh, releases some pretty toxic stuff. Um, and I, I, I want to bring this to everyone's attention. I mean, we, we all become complacent. Randy, you were talking about that earlier. I mean, there, there's, we're all subject to becoming complacent. You know, everything's going along fine. And, uh, oh, yeah, you know, our hot, hard hats are, are hot. We need to put them on. Our safety vests are hot. We need to put them on. Um, I'm not, I'm not wearing my, my, uh, my gas, uh, uh, sensors. So, uh, what's worse is almost three o'clock in the morning when the excavator catches on fire, uh, my walking boss was not at this hole at that instant. He was two holds down. My folks on the shore, my short, my truck, uh, loadout truck person was logging in trucks. My scale, my short scale person was logging in scale tickets. My walking boss was on the vessel. And frankly, <clears throat> there was a, a significant delay <clears throat> between the time that people saw this incident and relayed to the ship's crew, the urgency of what was going on in the hole. And the ship's, the officer of the deck, of course, at three o'clock in the morning is there, but let's face it, he was drinking coffee. And by the time they got the fire pumps fired up, got the hoses out, the chief officer came running over. Uh, by the time this, blaze was extinguished, there was a significant amount of time elapsed. And my point here is, this is a gotcha, or it could be a gotcha. Uh, of course, we lost some cargo, we did. I mean, some of the cargo was damaged. Uh, they finally, they got the fire hose over the side, they got the, the blaze extinguished. Uh, we lost a, a significant amount of, of time in, in delays, we lost um, the 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 captain at two o'clock in the morning. Do you think Gary's wide awake? No, I'm I'm back in the hotel. I'm asleep because everything's running smoothly. And the cat, I'm on the phone with my walking boss. The captain needs to call his office in Greece. In Greece, and he says to me, "My sat phone's down." Well, of course it is. Everything else, you know, I mean, when it hits, it rains, it pours when it rains. Um, we all have WhatsApp, which is a terrific phone. I said, Captain, what's, Master, what's the number? He gives me the number. I dial the number on my WhatsApp phone. The duty officer in Greece answers. I tell him there's been an incident on your vessel. You need to contact the captain. Um, an hour has gone by between the time, more than an hour, between the, the, the beginning of the incident 
everything's under control. Uh, this is this is something. This is a, a potential surveyor gotcha. You know, we need to be prepared. We need, and it's hard to stay alert. Everything's everything's running fine until it's not. What happens when you burn urea? Molten urea de decomposes into ammonia gas and isocyanic acid. And you don't want to be breathing that stuff. And I don't want these guys breathing that stuff. And if any of you are involved with loading ammonium nitrate, or if you're around ammonium nitrate, if you're close to ammonium nitrate, please be aware of all the things that need to be followed. Because that very easily could have been ammonium nitrate for me. Luckily, it wasn't. We're all aware of Beirut. And the aftermath of that. On one of my trips in the South American region, I was surveying a facility. And as I entered the facility, <clears throat> there was cargo stored, and there were these gas tanks. And it says, no smoking. And I asked the facility manager, sir, where are, where's your fire hose? Where's your water tank? Oh, he says, no, we just use city water. He says, well, do you understand that I'm here serving your facility, specifically uh, looking at your stove of ammonium nitrate? Now that's ammonium nitrate in Spanish which happened to be fairly close to those tanks. Now, when Beirut went up, that was 2,000 tons. Have you all heard of West Texas? There's a little town in Texas called West. They had 60 tons. When it went up, the blast crater was about a half a mile in diameter. Took out an old folks home, took out the railroad, took out a lot, 60 tons. Their route was 2,000 tons. Uh, I'm using my moisture meter, checking the moisture content. And what do you think about 50,000 tons? Directly in front of the gas tanks, incidentally. And I said to the facility manager, so you don't have a water hose and you don't have a water tank. So what is your evacuation plan? Because you only need to evacuate this facility. Oh, did I mention that this facility was in the, in the middle of a neighborhood? And there's homes all around. Except directly towards the end here. And you really can't see from this picture, but there's a beach. Do you see any armed guards around here? This is ammonium nitrate. Do you see any armed guards? I don't see any armed guards. And there's a beach. And you can drive your little Honda, a little little boat up to the beach at two o'clock in the morning when everybody's asleep, snatch a couple of these bags, dump a little diesel fuel on it and go blow something up. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna discuss the location of this. It was, it was discouraging to me. Um, that's my hour. <laughs> I, I hope that I brought some interesting information to the to the uh, to the table to think about
some some interesting thoughts. Again, as my my job as a surveyor is to observe and report. I observed and I reported ammonium nitrate stove. I I I would be willing to bet that it's probably still there. On the other hand, I was the last professional on this on site at the time, and my report has been filed. Can I answer any questions? I've got about 15 minutes. Whilst we wait for questions, Gary, can I just pop in and say thank you very much? Um, uh, I said yesterday about uh, the importance of understanding where your specialism lies. Quite clear to me where your specialism lies. So uh, thank you for sharing that. I think it's fabulous. Any questions for Gary? Thank you very much, Mike. Appreciate it. Stunned everybody into silence, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no. Well, let, let, me tell you how, let me tell you how much fun I have being a surveyor. Because to me, this is the best job on the planet. Now, I'm fortunate that I also have yachts and small craft. And I know that much of what was discussed here today is yachts and small craft. Um, I have a similar presentation for yachts and small craft as many of all of us daily see these, I, I hate to say it this way, but whiskey tangle fox. Are you kidding me? This is um, astounding. My mouth drops open and I, I'm stunned in the silence like apparently my audience is today. But uh, as, as surveyors, it's our job to observe and report and protect the interests of our customers. Yeah, it's, um, I think it's a labor of love. And I think, I think we talked yesterday about surveying and uh, those who are in surveying and who do it as a career as you do, and, and indeed others here do. Um, I think that's wonderful. But I think for those who are looking to get into it, we touched on mentoring as well yesterday. The amount of knowledge that you've displayed in the last hour now that's not something that you can pick up in you know one or two years it just isn't and uh it's one of the great questions going forward is how you end up and others like you end up sharing that knowledge with other people so that the surveying profession can continue on when i was first exposed those of you who don't know me um i am not a technical person it's not my background at all and when i went on to my first um job with a group of surveyors when I joined IIMS I was absolutely amazed I had no idea as indeed uh, do most of us who don't get involved with ships and ports and docks what actually goes on in there um, I watched the loading of I think there were six super yachts though they were uh, sun seeker yachts I know, 10 million dollars each or something perhaps a bit more than that being loaded onto a cargo ship that was carrying a cargo of uh, steel from Rotterdam en route to the Mediterranean. And what struck me is the uh, power, perhaps isn't the right word, but the control that the Marine Surveyor who was uh, involved in that job, who actually was our, uh, is our, now our immediate past president, the amount of control he exercised, uh, the Russian skipper of the crew of the uh, ship had decided he was you know, good to go in six hours. And Jeff simply said, well, no, sorry, um, unbook the pilot. You know, this ship is not going to be ready to go. Those boats will not be ready, and I'm not signing at all. So there we are. That, that, that's it from me. <laughs> May I have a moment just for a short, a short uh, yacht sea story? I have a customer who's got me on a 150 foot vessel, brand new. Well, all right, it was a year and a half old. Um, I am assuming that the that the misses on a 30 plus million dollar vessel uh, is a high net worth individual. I'm in the head, the Mrs. Head. And I asked the chief officer, I said, chief, I'd like to see the secondary egress, please. He said, oh, sure. And we're in the head and he reaches up and he grabs a handle on the, on the wall and he opens up the door to, into an escape tunnel, but the door bangs into the water control handle on the shower head. 
and it goes bang and he shuts the door and he opens the door again bangs into the shower head and again then on the third time it's chief chief you can do that a thousand times it's going to bounce every time into that may i suggest to move this hinges from the left side of the door to the right side of the door he says you know um no one's ever noticed that before and my point being is here's here's this yacht with a high net worth individual the misses no less and she can't get out through secondary egress and no one has noticed this hmm. it's our job to to see these things and make suggestions it was an easy fix but i'm thinking to myself of all of the people in the world to not be able to get out through her secondary egress this lady this is this has got to be this is a whiskey tangle fox I'm, I'm sorry I, I wanted to share that because i was again astounded that two other surveyors prior to me hadn't seen that apparently they didn't believe in i i don't, don't want to say that they didn't ask for that specific they didn't follow the the procedure if, with with respect to you know that safety procedure that you've got to be able to get off the boat hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Gary. Any other questions or points for Gary before we um, close out for a, a break and some coffee, I think? Well, thank you, everybody, for, for your attention. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, that's great. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Gary. If I could ask you to uh, stop your share, please.